Janie from Tax Free 15 with uh, researcher and author William Stewart. Now, William's latest book, which is called 911 to Armageddon, has just been published. So we're just going to touch on a few points from his book. A good place to begin is finding out just how wars actually start. Now, most people believe that wars are a result of things like, uh, say, a breakdown in diplomacy or talks or a border dispute or responding to a perceived or real attack. Uh, I think most people will be really, really shocked to discover that wars are actually planned in a cold and calculating way by a small criminal minority. So. These people have actually sat down and planned the murder and suffering of countless millions over the years. So let's get down to basics, William, and find out just who these people are and what their agenda is. The answer to that is surprising because it goes back to 697 when a central bank was created in Venice with various agents attached to it. And what we do know is that over uh, hundreds of years, this bank arranged a variety of different wars, as well as the sort of slaving and currency manipulation and so forth. And we do find them at work uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean from that early date, uh, eventually spreading through into Europe. And it's a central bank which hides itself in what we call red masonry or Templar lodges, uh, the reason they're called Templar Lodges is because this organization took over the Templars in 1099 and uh, turned them into the occultists that they became. So what we've got is this, this movement uh, from Venice into the Eastern Mediterranean and then slowly up into, into Europe. The organization is really a central bank which likes to cause uh, our wars. And that is done for two reasons. First of all, for profit, to making money, arms, supplies and so forth to both sides. And secondly, uh, to make conquest of lands and governments uh, and to exploit them once they have fallen. So what we're talking about is a group of people who are basically asset stripping and working to a particular structure. Yes, they are. I believe I've mentioned this in a previous broadcast, but they plan what they're going to do uh, 120 years before they act. So for that reason, it's extremely difficult to find out who did things. And when you begin to get on the trail, the people responsible are already dead. And they work really through the, the grandson. So it's probably grandfather who does the planning. And then you get the various uh, workings up to the event. And it's the grandson who triggers the event. Uh, I've got numerous instances of this. And uh, it surprised me as much as it will surprise your listeners. You say 120 years. Is this a set figure? Why is there a magical reason for 120 years apart from the fact that the original planner will be dead? Well, there is, yeah. I mean, it appears in Fama Fraternitatis, which is one of their uh, secret documents. And it mentions that in 120 years, a door will open. And you do get it, first of all, in there. What it represents is the uh, time when these bankers, you call them Lombards, Italian bankers, a time when they were driven out of Europe and driven out of Britain for bankrupting it. And they spent, roughly speaking, 120 years in exile, being kept uh, contained in Venice. So that's the reason for the 120 years. It's a kind of revenge. It, 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 it makes them feel right in what they're doing, I suppose. Is it sort of like a little joke on their part, really? Yeah, yeah I think it's a pretty sick joke, but I, I, it, it, is a, it, is, it is a joke. <laughs> But they do that um, because we'll be coming on to probably just discussing a little bit um, another joke that they have, which is to take the book of Revelation, which has seven great crises in it, which are called the breaking of seals. They call their company after the author of that last book of the Bible, Revelation. They call it the John Company. They also uh, make up their rituals from the book of Revelation. That's the last book of the Bible. And they match the seven particular wars to the book of Revelation, the breaking of the seals. So there is some idea of what they're like. They turn good into evil, evil into good, as it were. So they, they will tell their little jokes. Right. You talked about seven seals and that equates to seven wars. So where did these wars start? And what really, what was the first war? 
there have been a number of wars right the way going back in history, of course, and um, the Thirty Years' War was one of theirs. But I want to bring it right up to the present, or let us say the 1700s, and just begin there because that's when the strategic wars start, and it's the moment when the central bank in Venice sent out an agent, a main agent, who was part of the family bank called Antonio Conti. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what Conti arranged. We're going back into 1700s, and history does not cover any of this, and history will have another version, but I can't help that. This is simply part of my research and what I have found out. Now, in 1730, Conti, Agent Conti, opened the Boston Lodges. He did so in conjunction with Isaac Newton, who was working inside the Bank of England, who was the Grand Master of Zion, or the, of the Templars, and foreign shareholders in the bank, uh, bank of England, that is, joined in to assist this process. Now, the Bank of England at that time, which of course is now a reform bank, but at that time it had been founded by the Lombards and was working in link with Geneva, uh, which was again a centre for all this, and Geneva was working in, in link with Venice. So their agent arrived in Britain, and one of the things he did in 1730 was to open these Templar lodges. These are the lodges that set off the American War of Independence, which is their first strategic war. And they did so in conjunction with banking. Then we move to actually a little bit before that in 1713. And Conti was at work in France, founding all kinds of secret lodges there. One of these lodges trained Voltaire. And Voltaire was to meet with both Conti and Benjamin Franklin, who uh, helped to set off the American War of Independence in the Nine Sisters Lodge in Paris. And this was one of the major sort of espionage bases for the Lombard process. So we can trace what became the French Revolution straight back to Conti and to the Nine Sisters Lodge of Paris. Later on, the French Revolution was set off by Lord Shelburne, and there are still documents in the British Museum to show this. And he triggered the French Revolution, which was going to be SEAL II or War II. Uh, as I say, the fiery letters of Shelburne and his assistants stoking up revolution are in the British Museum. Now, Lord Shelburne, again the 1700s, was the chairman of what is called the East India Company, which of course is part of, uh, of Lombard uh, control. The whole company belonged to them. So now we have uh, some you know, very solid and suspicious facts around the French Revolution. Then in 1740, I think it's about 1740 to about 1750, uh, the de Saussure family, who uh, uh, came from Frontenac Castle in Geneva, uh, moved to South Carolina, and they were actually agents of this whole process at that time. So what you find is that the family settles in uh, South Carolina, and it's the Daniel, the grandson of the family, who kept in contact, constant contact with Frontenac Castle. It is he who helped to trigger and steer the American Civil War. Now we've got an, another agent who's called Mazzini, always worked in the 1800s, following Conti in the 1700s. And Mazzini went over to America uh, and worked at presidential level to make sure that the Civil War, American Civil War occurred. Though you know that was a war of great butchery with the Astors on one side, the Rothschilds on the other, and both of these two founded the Round Table. From Russia, um, which again is going to be our third war, uh, we've, we discover that the East India Company's secret society, which is called Fratres Lucis, was operating in Russia in the 1700s. So although we can't exactly have the same process and say this agent did that, uh, both uh, Conti and Mazzini and their agents were at work in Russia. Throughout the 1800s, Mazzini put his agents into Russia, somebody called Pappas, who was an agent, and the agent of Martinism and Synarchy, which is basically the right wing dominating the left wing process. And so we know that it was all there. But what happened in that particular war, which helped me to put you know, my pictures together, was that the Russian Revolution actually began to fail because the peasants remained, and the people remained, loyal to the Tsar. And so what had to happen was there had to be some direct intervention. And intervening in the process of the Russian Revolution uh, was Rothschild, J.P. Morgan, Kung Lo Company, Warburg, and Rockefeller, and also the American International Company, AIC. 
And Jacob Schiff, who was Kung Loeb, that's one of the, you know, the, the big bankers in America who are linked to this system at that time, which became Lehman Brothers, uh, he, ha he actually had the Tsar murdered. So there we see for the first time something surfacing quite clearly. In the American Civil War, you get the Round Table forming uh, as a result of that war in Britain, which um, again conducts further wars. But then you get these names attached to the war that was planned for Russia. You've briefly skimmed over the, both the American War of Independence and the Civil War in America. And I know you have a lot of listeners in the United States. So can, can we just go back over that, William? I, I think a lot of Americans hold to the view that the reason that the War of Independence started was because they were being governed by England, they were paying taxes to England, and they were being made to purchase and import goods from England rather than making it themselves. So how does that relate to these bankers and their agents? Well, firstly, they had a number of shareholders. All, pretty much all the shareholders in the Bank of England were of foreign kind. And these bankers went out of their way deliberately to affect American money. There are one or two other things that they did, but generally speaking, they uh, helped that, that war to trigger. The relationships between America and Britain were always excellent. And it was only at a certain point when they were being troubled, apparently by Britain, that uh, we, we moved towards the possibility of conflict. The second thing that happened is not just the, the Bank of England doing this, or well, that really is a major factor. The second thing is they founded something called the Hellfire Clubs, and the British Army, the British Navy were represented in the Hellfire Club, including the American main agents. So they, they were all meeting together in the Hellfire Clubs, and these were then linked across into France, into the Nine Sisters Lodge. So you've got a, a system of espionage in which even Benjamin Franklin was initiated into uh, Red Masonry, and that Red Masonry drove the Hellfire Clubs and drove the Nine Sisters Lodge. So you've got a form of Red Masonry created, which, again, is part of the process of, of causing that war. The reason it happened, that is the American Civil War, because Britain had uh, over... 50 or more years had been trying to reform the East India Company, which was the Lombard, main Lombard presence in England. And the, the government of Britain was beginning to attack it. And they saw the warning signs and were looking for a new place to go and a new country to infect. So you get these various little bits of information coming together and showing what actually happened. On the surface, the wars between America and Britain under the surface it was all started by these um, central bankers, and the object was to try to take over America. So that's what happened. If you wanted just to sort of fill in a little bit of detail, I'll just say of the American Civil War, what the Lombards tried to do there was basically take on America and beat America. So there was a stunning victory in which they were pushed backwards. It didn't stop them eventually using the peace years to create their central banking in America. But nevertheless, they, they wanted to split America in half, joining parts of the southern states to South America. And then after they split America, they then wanted to go into the attack again and take over all of it. But the American Civil War was a little bit like the Battle of Britain. The right side won and won uh, fairly decisively because we know what was behind it. The President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, was shot dead because of the way he wanted money to be independent of the Lombards. So he lost his life uh, in the same way as Kennedy over exactly the same issue. I interrupted you mid-flow when you were working your way through the various wars. So you got to Russia. So <laughs> carry on with that, William. Um, it, needs to be, it needs to be read. You need, need to read the book. I, I know we're covering such a lot of information over such a, a sort of broad passage of time. It's very difficult to put it into words and... In a way, the book does it logically, whereas I'm just trying to give an overall picture for without yeah. too much detail. Uh, so, yeah, we've come to Germany and we've had two very surprising wars there. Conti went over to Berlin in somewhere around between 1713 and 1715. And he was hard at work there with the Berlin Red Lodges, the Rosicrucians, um, Templar Lodges for anything up to two and a half years. 
And although we don't get much of an insight into what was going on there, what we can say very clearly is that in 1781, the lodges that actually set off World War II were being activated in uh, Austria. And all the exact lodges that Hitler used were set up in 1781. There's quite a lot one could say about the German war, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get too drawn on that. But Hitler, when it came to uh, appointing a corporal and the SS leader who was a chicken farmer, when it came to putting them into office, uh, Lambach Abbey in Austria already had the Nazi swastikas set up in it since about 1865. Hitler was recruited into Lambach Abbey, and within the space of a few months, the Grand Master of the Templars, who is also called Liebenfels, the father of German socialism, came to see him there. And later on, when the secret societies were set up in Germany, or rather when they were all activated, because they'd already been set up, uh, the Grand Master of the Templars uh, was one of those major groups. So you can see that, you know, that there are a whole lot of suspicious stuff. I have drawn that together in a book which will be out, um, you know, in a few months' time about the Nazis and, and that era. Mazzini follows Conti, and what you find in Switzerland, and it's always Switzerland, I assure you, was the layman conspiracy or young Germany, and what uh, Mazzini did was to train up revolutionaries, occult revolutionaries, because if you know the Third Reich, you know the occult, and he sent them back in streams back to Austria and back to Germany. There's another group in Britain, uh, which I've called the English Cell, and that too was training up people and sending them all over Europe to carry out their various functions to make sure that World War occurred. We know a little bit more about the Second World War simply because it's, you know, it's in recent history. The information is there and the information was, was buried. World War I was started in 1711 and what happened was an agent of the British East India Company went over to Saudi Arabia and founded what became the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, he also founded, and it's in the script, he also founded occult lodges all over the Middle East. So this Muslim Brotherhood arose in power when they wanted it to, which was to cause World War I by breaking up the Ottoman Empire. And that Ottoman Empire uh, was being manhandled and manipulated anyway by, by the said bankers. So we can account for World War I, we can account for World War II, we can produce the data on it and we can say that the same lodges, the same bankers, the same central bank, the same sort of industrial military complex uh, were involved in the seven strategic wars. What uh, World War II brought us, of course, was the European Union and the bankers who created the European Union are the same bankers who planned Nazism and communism in 120 to 140 Broadway, New York. Just going back to World War II, there's a lot of evidence that uh, certain corporate leaders such as Avril Harriman and Bush's grandfather, Prescott Bush, uh, were involved in supporting Hitler, um, helping to build up his empire. Yeah, that's a part of it, and that's perfectly true. And that link goes to the Dutch banks and then through into Germany. Uh, and the funding was coming again from the bankers. As I said, it's 120 to 140 Broadway, which is a group of the six bankers operating from New York. The important point to recognize there is that these bankers are more or less controlled. I don't think they own the money that they so lavishly spend. And they are linked through into the round table groups in Britain and to the round table groups across Europe and into Switzerland. So there's a, there's a, there's a big group of bankers, European, Russian, German, British and American, who know perfectly well what they have done. So there was a swill of money, and then also um, supplies of armaments and ammunition. Uh, and indeed, uh, Rockefeller Standard Oil supp supplied uh, oil to the Third Reich all the way through the Second World War. So there's quite a lot to look at there. What you end up with is being quite certain that money was behind the whole process, and when they got rid of Hitler and the Nuremberg trials erased the rest of them, you still had the bankers who did the paying, who did the planning uh, as of the se of 1700s, still intact, still there, uh, untouched and much, much richer. And basically they went scot-free. They went completely scot-free. They must have known then, I think, some people, but we know who they are. And they got away with, with it completely, yes. And, and when the shutters come down and the secrecy starts, of course, that generation, we're talking of the three generations now, or 120 years, that generation's already dead. And so all the links go back to them and then seem to be lost. 
So that accounts for six wars that all seem to have the same sort of structure within them. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So there's one missing. Uh, there's one missing. <laughs> so... There's one missing. And so we have six wars, six seals. We've got war number seven to come. And we can just remind ourselves of how that starts. It'll start 120 years before it happens. So if you take a strategic date like 9-11, then you count back 120 years and you end up with 1881. And what I'd like to do now is uh, very briefly, and I know this is all a bit complicated, but we're going to look very briefly at 1881. Well, what was significant about 1881? Right. Well, first of all, I want to just talk about a little link between 9-11 and 1881. So I'm going to talk about September the 11th. Why September the 11th? Why did that occur in the United States of America twice? The first time was when 11 states in America tried to kick the Red Lodges or the Templar Lodges and the bankers out of America altogether. And this group of anti-Masons, as they called them, but of course it wasn't pre-Masonry, it was Red Masonry, they met each September the 11th for at least 10 years and tried to remove the Lombards and the Red Lodges from America. We've got to remember that at the same time, if you think of the connections, the Muslim Brotherhood, which belonged to the bankers, had been set up in the Middle East. So there's a little sort of sideways link. And we can start this 1881 with the fact that the Red Masons and their bankers murdered a Mr. Morgan around 1830. He was a, one of the leaders of anti-Masonry. And very curiously, his body was discovered in 1881. So you get a kind of jolt whereby it's almost as if somebody is saying to America, I'm warning you, that was our judgment and there's more to come. The Lombards, Red Lodges, judge humanity, thinking themselves to be John of Patmos. And I can produce the degrees which show that that is the case. So they're, they're really judging America, I believe for September the 11th and the attempts to get rid of uh, rid of them and to remove their banking system uh, and all the problems that, that they had caused. 1881 was when the bankers, who had been kicked out of Britain, incidentally, in 1874 with the closure of the East India Company, returned to Britain. This nasty group, which became Round Table, came back to Britain. It came through to create the Fabian Society, Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House, formed, first of all, by the, the German Rothschilds, Astors and Bate. And the Round Table turned out to be a war-making organisation, of course, because we see where it came from. It came from the bankers. And it set off the Boer War and the Russian Revolution. It spread into America as a splinter of Round Table called the CIA, not the main CIA, but a splinter of it. The Council of Foreign Relations, Bilderberg, and Trilateral Commission, which currently fall to the Rockefellers, but to the, to the bankers. So you've got forming uh, a cell in America, a cell in Britain, which is called uh, Round Table. And this all came from the 1881 return of the Lombards to Britain through something called the Sidgwick Group, which then morphed into the Round Table groups. Today, the links between these two groups are called BAP, the British American Project. And you'll find at one end is the Round Table in Britain, at the other end is the round table in America, and the British one links into the European Union. So you've got this uh, uh, not a government organisation, very rich, very powerful, a horrible background, which is operating today. So there you've got, you know, something quite significant in 1881. You've got the, the war making groups returning to Britain and then moving and strengthening their position in America. 1881 a new and very virulent form of Red Templar masonry was created, used to hide all the goings-on, and it was called, is called, the Ancient and Primitive Rite. Now, this was circulated in the Middle East, so we know that a war-making rite was added to all the other things that we've had in the Middle East since 1710, and the creation of the Muslim Brotherhood. So, obviously, the Muslim Brotherhood that is affected by this catches hold of the Ancient and Primitive Rite. So, the three groups that we know about, the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, Bilderbergs and the Trilateral Commission, you're saying is actually linked to a splinter group of the CIA? Yes, I mean, as you know, CIA does good work for America. There are a lot of great patriots in it. They did some um, you know, very good work. Some of them did some very good work. 
around the time of 9-11, uh, but unfortunately some of them did not. And what the Lombards do is they take our main institutions, including intelligence units, and they split them so that you've got what you know about and then something hidden underneath. The Fabians was a very good example of this, for instance. Uh, it had a utopian uh, left wing on the outside, which founded the Labour Party. Inside it was run by the most extreme, uh, radical, rancid bankers, uh, the Society of the Elect. So you get the idea. And yes, there is a, a, a link between the splinter that they've created of the CIA and Rockefeller's relative who created the CIA and then the Rockefeller groups, which are, as you say, Council of Foreign Relations, Bilderberg and Triatric Commission. Well, I'll let you get back to 1881. What else was significant? Right. In 1881 uh, so it was going on in 1882, begun in 1881, Baron Edmund Rothschild was working with what are called radical Zionists. Now, these are people who uh, outwardly want the, the state of Israel to exist and to be reasonably right wing. But Zionism itself can be traced back into the young movement of the Lombards. So really speaking, uh, 1881, Baron Edmund Rothschild met with Lombard planning for uh, right-wing activity in the Middle East to try to set up, if you like, a young Israel or a right-wing Israel state. He contacted uh, Rabbi Samuel, and I'll call him Rabbi Samuel because I can't even begin to pronounce the, the second name, but he's Rabbi Samuel. Rabbi Samuel was expecting Armageddon, that's the Seventh War, a final battle of Armageddon to take place after which a new nation, Israel, would arise and conquer all the areas of, around it as found in the Old Testament. And I have to ask you what Mr. Rothschild Banker was doing, organizing such a, in a, such a volatile region with people who actually wanted Armageddon. Now, I, I put in the book there are other rabbis and so forth on the same tack, but of course, we are dealing with a radical organization which is banker based. It is nothing to do with the state of Israel. And those are perfectly genuine, good, nice people in Israel who have nothing to do with this. Now, we have to return a little bit and try to fit these things together. In 1881, Western bankers began to take control of the Ottoman Empire. And don't forget, it's the Ottoman Empire that um, the breakup of it by the Muslim Brotherhood, owned by our bankers that caused World War I. Then uh, the war-making round table, which we've talked very briefly about, which was the Lombards coming back to Britain and going to America, having been kicked out of Britain. Uh, they were fresh from causing the Boer War and the Russian Revolution a bit later on. They took charge of the process of creating the State of Israel at the Paris Peace Conference of 2nd of November 1919. And it was called the Balfour Declaration after somebody who was sort of attached, as it were, to the British government. But unfortunately, the bankers were using the Milner Round Table, the one that did the Boer War and later the Russian Revolution, and so on, to create the State of Israel. And this truth did not come out until the 21st of July 1936, as released by parliamentarian Ormsby Gore. So you tell me what the war makers were doing setting up a state of Israel that wanted and expected Armageddon being founded by the most profound war makers on earth. So, Sir William, does that make the foundation of the state of Israel a little bit sinister? No, it doesn't really, um, because the state of Israel came together involving in the main some very good people who many of them had, had a very bad time in Europe. They wanted their own state, and there's no particular reason why they shouldn't have one. Uh, what was sinister was the thing that was underneath it, which had not become clear. And later on, this Lombard pressure would be called the Ergun, the right-wing aspect of Israel, the bit that wanted to take over other areas. And that is really the, the sinister bit. That's why we've got trouble in the Middle East. We can't pin things down and find out where they're coming from. So it's not the state of Israel. It's something underneath it. Uh, well, from some of the reading I've done, you, you're, you're saying that the Jews had a bad time, yes, but I have seen that Hitler was actually encouraged to make the life of Jewish people in Germany rather intolerable, initially intolerable, before he started using the concentration camps in order to try and make Jews want to voluntarily leave the country and go to Israel. That is very true, and the first plan was to send them to Madagascar and that continued right the way through before they actually started to kill them. This is absolutely correct. I mean, there were other forces at work. For instance, the Russian 
pogroms which against the Jews, which were conducted really with uh, very vicious attacks on them, making them guilty for things that they had not done, for assassinations, for instance, said that the move against the Jews was much more than Hitler. It was quite profound, and I do believe that they, they hope very much to set up something for some reason. I agree with you. Okay, so let's go back to 1919. Right, well, 1919, you begin to see a little bit of planning going on. At the planning of the State of Israel, Paris Peace Conference, was somebody called Untermeyer, who was a part of blackmailing President Wilson and also Prime Minister Lord Lloyd George. He was doing that on behalf of the arms trade and the bankers, of course. His blackmail led to the appointment of Justice Brandeis, who took America into World War I. And remember, World War I had been planned from 1710 in Saudi Arabia. He was also the man who hired somebody called Schofield, and Schofield produced the Armageddon Bible. It's called the Schofield Bible. And what that does is to suggest that Armageddon, the seventh war in the book of Revelation, the seventh seal, that this is somehow inevitable, that it's a physical war, and that it's going to take place in Israel. So here you've got a Bible backing up what the Rothschilds did in 1881. The Bible was incidentally completed in 1881. And the Bible suggests a physical war to happen in the Middle East in Israel. The Paris Peace Conference, of course, made its decisions and reported back to the Rothschilds, and its decisions were obviously helped by the fact the arms trade were blackmailing uh, the English Prime Minister and also the American President. So now you've got the prospect of War 7 being formed, and you can find evidence that, that this is the case. You'll see that the Council of Foreign Relations, Bilderberg Trilateral in the USA, hoped to control foreign affairs in America and the military, as well as having people like White House President Carter in the Trilateral Commission itself. So you see, foreign affairs and a lot of what happens uh, can be influenced by people who have never been elected and who have an actual agenda. And because people don't know about the agenda, they will not be able to explain uh, what is happening in an area, for instance, like the Middle East. So there you've got just some cases of 1881, and these issues will then dovetail into things that happen a bit later on. So let's talk about Armageddon Masonry. How, how does that all come in then? Here, Armageddon Masonry, which belongs to the Red Lodges that I've been talking about, which belong to the Lombard bankers who are now operating from Venice, Geneva, and presumably from um, their round table in Britain and their round table in America, uh, as indeed in the modern world from elsewhere. You could hop over to the Cayman Isles in five seconds. But uh, here we've got Armageddon Masonry, and it is attached to these secretive lodges that are run by bankers. Now, you might say you must be stark raving mad to come across with an idea like Armageddon Masonry. That is the creation, deliberate creation of seven strategic wars. But I suppose, in a way, the culprits, the bankers, must have slipped up a little bit in that Armageddon Masonry is described in various books. It is, for instance, in the dictionary of A. E. Waite, the Dictionary of Freemasonry. There you will find that and, and seven seals described at the same time. So... It's not such a guess after all. There is such a thing. They are working to this plan, uh, and I have found it. Lombard agent Conti, who was really basically behind the, the, the initial structures in the 1700s, was a defrocked priest, as many of these agents were, actually. They, they, they operated the Central Bank of Venice. They, they were in the church. They um, did unpleasant things and were thrown out. So there you've got a defrocked priest who knows every word of the Bible, and who has decided that one of the big jokes will be to use the book of Revelation to savage Europe, America and Britain. I'm going to talk just now about what I have found. Now, you note that when Israel was founded, the Rothschilds were um, recruiting Armageddon, people who actually believed that the state of Israel needed Armageddon before it could spread to the territories that it should have. Uh, that's not talking about it or average Israelis or families or their government. We're talking about something that actually happened, but it was separate from what you'd expect. In the Middle East, uh, there are numerous lodges of the Templars, founded in Saudi Arabia in 1710, exported to Turkey and other nations. And here, people trained to see good as evil, evil as good, and they planned to conduct the strategic wars I've talked about, 
And we have their statement, statement of Mazzini and Albert Pike, an American red mason, on three world wars, which they, they discussed in some detail. So, first of all, Armageddon looks very possible simply because you've got these lodges spread throughout the Middle East. Then you've got the Hamas Armageddon. Again, this is a branch, although they say it isn't. It is a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, founded by the East India Company, founded by the Lombard bankers. It's from the Islamic resistance movement, which taught Gog and Magog, which is basically saying Armageddon, the killing of Jews and the Arabs' apocalyptic rise to full power. Palestine to them is a religious trust consecrated for Muslim use until Judgment Day, when the Jews and the Arabs will fight. So deep down inside Hamas, you've not only got the protocols of the Elders of Zan, which is the thing that took the Jews into the Holocaust. Then there's the Israeli Armageddon. This comes mainly today through the right wing of Israel, the Ergun, Gog and Magog again. The Armageddon in Israel, which is an apocalyptic war in which Israel would rise to new power in the region. Members actually wish for this return of God and a religious battle. All of Palestine, etc., would be theirs. And such agents were, of course, supported by the main uh, mega or main bankers, including the Rothschilds. Then there's one you don't know about, perhaps, and that's the Christian Armageddon. And Christians have been trained to the Schofield Bible, which says we've got to have rapture and we've got to have Armageddon. It's coming soon. In 2002, 371 of them uh, were sent to Israel. They expected to create a Jewish state, one suitable and ready to experience the second coming of Jesus as the act of Armageddon. And the Schofield Bible was, of course, their, their guide to this, but then the Schofield Bible was made by the mega bankers. In 1991, a large meeting of such Christians took place in Basel, Switzerland, where they announced the near presence of the second coming called Armageddon. So don't let's say that we are dealing with something that is not provable. There is an occult lodge Armageddon, Hamas, Israelis and Christian and then we deal with the Schofield Armageddon, which again is a Bible circulating the most popular in America. It doesn't circulate in other, any other place, I don't think, or not to such an extent. And they taught a physical battle of Armageddon in Megiddo, west of Jordan. And the Alaska Mosque in Jerusalem was to be destroyed, causing an unstoppable religious war. At that point, the third temple of the Jews would be built on that spot. And the third temple actually is mentioned in the Schofield Bible. Now, of course, they've made all this up. Since then, to this very day, there have been attempts to blow up the Alaska Mosque and also plans have been made by, by major occultists to rebuild the Temple of Jerusalem. Uh, the last sort of fracas was on February the 24th, 2012, not very long ago, to blow up the Alaska Mosque and to rebuild the temple. Planners are, they're either American gangsters with mega contacts in the background with other people doing the, 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 the front work. So just to recap, in the Hamas, the Islamic view, in the Jewish, Israeli view, and in the Christian, they are all wanting to have this Armageddon war right in Israel, Palestine. Oh, absolutely. And if you take the Christian part of it, we, we can trace that back to Jacob Schiff, who paid for the Armageddon Bible. He is one of the, the six big bankers in America who, as I say, are linked through elsewhere. If we go to Saudi Arabia, they call it Wahhabism, but I haven't called it that. I've called it Hemphorism after the agent who created a, a fake religion there, which became the Muslim Brotherhood. It is a religious system which allows, and it's not a religious system, it's an irreligious system which allows Muslim to fight Muslim, and it has a Quran attached to it which matches the Armageddon Bible, and the Quran drops any sort of reasonable care for Jews and Christians. Now, this has been commented on by their own scholars. The reason I've changed the name to Hempherism is because Hempher was an East India agent who planted this fake religion in Saudi Arabia in 1710, uh, created occult lodges throughout the Middle East and spread it out in that particular kind of way. So you'll get people in Saudi Arabia who follow Wahhab, uh, Wahhabism, and they may be perfectly genuine good people who take that on as their religion and there's no way we want to get into discrimination and to attacking people's religions, but we can say something about a political movement. So I've called it Hemperism. Was the original Mr. Wahab, was he, was he an agent or was he someone who was duped or seduced into starting the movement? He was entirely duped. He was set up. 
he was told that the dreams he had and the visions he had meant that he was linked back to Muhammad and all of that kind of thing. It was an absolute hoax. And they led him along and fed him all this stuff. And the East India Company, which, of course, is part of the Lombard process, they used to do this all over the world to disturb uh, a system or a religion and then set, but set one side against another side. In this case, it led to the tragedy of World War I, although no doubt they had various um, profitable ventures before that. But the strategic war that came out of this was World War One. No, they led him along. So you've got this Wahhab system set up in Saudi Arabia, which is basically to divide and conquer. Absolutely correct. You've got the, uh, in America, you've got the Christians being set up you, by Schofield. You've got Hempfer in Israel. They're being set up by Rothschild and a number of rabbis. So, yes, you can see the thing beginning to form where religions are intended to be the kind of thing that clashes. They're setting up for a, a future war. They're doing so 120 years before it is due to start. Not necessarily the big part of it, but before it is due to start. So are there any more Armageddon plans? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, there's a Shiite Armageddon. They've got something called the Bright Future Institute in Iran. It's a call centre so that people can ring up and find out when Armageddon is going to happen. And their prime minister is alleged to expect the return of the Mahdi, the 12th Imam, and a final religious war and judgment uh, to end the current present world. And they think it's very close. So was the Shiite Armageddon, was that actually set up by any of the lodges or, how, or did that just come about? It just happens to be there at the same time that all the other ones are forming. And we have no direct evidence to suggest how it was planted and, and how it is being maintained. But it's just thrown in because there's another one. And then the final sort of mix that I just need to end with is that 86 billion pounds, not million, billion pounds, was provided to spread the Saudi hemphorism of Mr. Wahhab, with millions of people being trained in madrasa-style schools who advocate jihad and war with the West. So all of these schools have uh, suddenly sprung up on this enormous sum of money in a variety of different countries. We're not talking, of course, about Wahhabism, which can be somebody's faith. We're talking about a political movement. And I think there I can just sort of bring this little bit of this stage to, to an end. Right. Well, we're back with part two of 911 to Armageddon with William Stewart. Where do we go now, William? Right. Well, we had an earlier question about the Armageddon theme in Iran. And what I said there was that the origin of that particular moment was a bit obscure where the Armageddon theme came from. And what I mean by that is that I haven't really followed the whole of that particular one through. But what I would say is it's the Trilateral Commission of Rockefeller and Mr. Ball of Trilateral Commission and President Carter of Trilateral Commission who moved the Shah of Iran, uh, made him uh, run from his country in 1979. And so, in a sense, the origin of what has happened there to Iran is really based in, back in the same old sort of setup. As part of all this, uh, there was a meeting of Rockefeller, uh, secret meetings in 1942 in Canada to plan the European Union. And this was first outlined by Giuseppe Mazzini, a Lombard agent, in 1837. So 120 years later, they created the 1957 meetings of Rome. First, we had Rockefeller secret meetings in 1942 in Canada to plan the European Union. And this was outlined first by Giuseppe Mazzini, called Giovine Europa in 1837. And exactly 120 years later, it was the beginning of the European Union and the 1957 meetings of Rome. The plans to take over Europe were organized by the CIA and, or rather, splinter, splinter group of the CIA, and uh, which paid four million in, in today's money to bring it about. Uh, attending that group in 1942 were those who would set up the Bilderberg Group, which went on to become the Trilateral Commission. So we know, roughly speaking, what we're dealing with. Uh, then in 1952, these same bankers were on the move. Alan Dulles, a relative of Rockefeller, had created and was running the CIA, or rather a splinter group of it, and brother John Dulles had created the United Nations using an entirely communist committee to do so, although he was extremely right-wing. So we're looking at the synarchy Nazi communism that both of them are running. And then in 1952, these two brothers, Alan and John, uh, were assisting the moves to remove Britain, France and Israel from Suez in around 1956, I think it was. 
uh, King Farouk was deposed, then the British commander of the Arab League. And when Britain was about to take the canal back, Eisenhower, on the advice of the Dulles pair, threatened to cash in Britain's war bonds, thus bankrupting Britain. When Britain turned to the IMF, which is run by the Hitler Bank, the Bank of International Settlements, that request for money was blocked. So when you look at that, you see that the Muslim Brotherhood, which is now in power in Egypt, was a somewhat inevitable outcome of a whole process. Then came trilateral action and the Shah of Iran fled in 1979. Once again, this is a, a irreligious cartel made up of the trilateral members, President Carter, Mr. Ball and Rockefeller, and of course others. But there you see Iran becoming a religious country, giving up the sort of security it had before to keep itself aloof from this uh, emerging brotherhood. Well, this sounds like a case of uh, the West playing politics in the Middle East yet again, because we put the Shah in in the first place, and now here we go taking the Shah out. Yeah, that's quite correct, and we've got two particular forces at work. One is the more legitimate Western forces, the other forces is the bankers' group. So you've got this interplay all the time, along with other pressures between uh, what was called capitalism and what was called communism. So there's a lot of change and a lot of flow. But what I'm trying to look at here is the development towards something which I think we might recognise when we get towards the end of this. On July 3rd, 1979... Brzezinski, the trilateral member uh, employed by Rockefeller, but that's employed by the banking cartel, paid for armed terrorism to begin in the world. They first of all armed the terrorists against the Marxist government of Afghanistan, uh, knowing that Russia would come to the aid of that legitimate government. And they were responsible for the deaths of many Russians, and once the Russians withdrew, they then turned their attack upon the rebels themselves. The rebels were armed, of course, through bin Laden, who at the time was working for the Splinter CIA, and also the BCCI Bank of Rothschild. Um, manager Hartman was doing the supplying, the bank being used for the various payments for arms. So Brzezinski, employed by Rockefeller, employed from Europe, so we're not dealing with America, we're dealing with these bankers who relate through to the round table in Britain and the round table in Europe, created the terrorism of the Middle East, which spread to 5,000 terrorists in Saudi Arabia, 3,000 in Yemen, 2,000 in Egypt, 2,800 in Algeria, 400 in Tunisia, 370 in Iraq, and 200 in Libya. Brzezinski was actually asked about this and the funding of terrorism, and he did himself admit that the attacks on the Marxist government and then on the Russians was part of his and the banker's plan. And he was asked if uh, about all the casualties that had occurred, and he said, well, what is more important, the Cold War ending or a few stirred-up Muslims? Now, of course, by this time, the death toll of all these disturbances is beginning to rise alarmingly. Well, people like Brzezinski, either they're as mad as March hares or they're inherently evil and devoid of any humanity. Well, you certainly start to think along those lines, don't you, as you, uh, as you begin to look at the Middle East full of uh, lovely little families and lots of good people, and you begin to wonder. Another employee of Rockefeller, incidentally, Henry Kissinger, pushed for his clash of civilizations, axis of evil, arc of crisis. Uh, he was a trilateral member and a servant, or, of course, as, as I've said, of Rockefeller. And he made it clear that he was not speaking for the Bush administration, but a kind of rogue America and British alliance, which we've previously talked about, BAP. And he was set up in business by the Warburgs. Those are the ones who helped fund the Nazis, the EU, Russian Revolution. And this uh, Afghan war really was never what it seemed. It was, if you like, round table from the start. We then moved from Afghanistan, which, I mean, was a disgrace, really, but, and we come to Iraq. A lot of people think that the reason that we went into Afghanistan was because of the global pipeline and a whole variety of reasons, but it seems as though it was planned a long time before these ideas came to the fore. So what is the actual reason that they did go into Afghanistan? Well, I think there are two reasons, and the, the first is that this is the old East India Company that we're talking about, 
which went trading with sword in hand, and they would look for the world's resources and then go for them. And there are some very rich resources to be had in that area. So there's one of the motivations. And those of you who like to try to trace the new world order and think about that can see another very big slice of the world falling to a particular banking arrangement. I think the two motives are there. And this particularly applies, as I say, to the general activity going on in the Middle East, which is taking one country after another into the grip of the few. When we come to the Iraq war, and I've done some detailed work on this, on the large number of lies that were told, war was prepared and uh, the media used to make it seem a reasonable activity. At the end of this Iraq war, terrorism itself had risen by 600% from just a handful of terrorists. I believe there are now 17,000. Madrasa schools, which are um, not the good ones, but the ones who are teaching jihad, run into the thousands and perhaps millions, where people are being taught hatred of the West. Saddam Hussein, who was very good at keeping the Brotherhood at bay, was hung. And now you can see you've got a very fluid situation created by these activities. We move on to Libya, where again you've got Gaddafi making a stand against the Muslim Brotherhood. Like Saddam, he was murdered. Much of the press against him was organised by black flag operations. He didn't do a lot of the things that he's supposed to have done. And so, although dictatorship is not a good thing, and most would admit that, at the same time, democracy is being taught as if it were, in the words of somebody else, a cup of instant coffee whereby you just put in hot water. Democracy takes 50 years, 60 years, 100 years to really develop. And what's happening here is crude intervention in these countries, which are then left in an awful state, and the policies of gain and the policies of power are being conducted very secretly. Yeah, on the subject of Iraq, I think we have to remember how the mainstream media played it and how they spun it was by repeatedly saying weapons of mass destruction. So it really got into people's heads that this was a justifiable war. Yes, in fact, there are 17 quite major lies deliberately told to start that war, and I have listed them. And when you get down to the end of the list, you think, my goodness me, what's happened to democracy? And why is nobody being brought forward to answer questions about all this? But there you go. Yes, indeed, um, it, it, was, it was a shocking uh, illegal war. So when we stand back a bit now, we're, we're looking at radical politics uh, with Britain, France and Israel uh, out of Egypt, the Shah out of Iran, the Marxist government and Russians out of Afghanistan, Saddam out of Iraq, Gaddafi out of Libya, and unfortunately that's not even the end of the story. Now all of these elements were very good at holding the Muslim Brotherhood in check. And I'd like you just to think back to uh, Conti and Mazzini, uh, agents who spent their lives making sure that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood united one country after another and became a significant force. So you see we're actually uh, back in that 1700s and 1800s mode in the Middle East. And so we've got all these faces that are covered, rebels who are obviously being paid by somebody, the Al-Qaeda flag flying in just about every event that has happened, and the sense that we're moving on to something really quite bad. Are there any connections between the trouble in the Middle East and the same bankers who funded the Russian Revolution? Well, that's a particularly good question, and I think what I'm going to do, if I may, I'll leave that for a little while, and we'll come back onto that. What I'd, what I'd like to look at is the event of 9-11 itself and see whether that's a genuine attack from overseas or whether it's something else, so that we can then put tuck that one away and say it appears to be perhaps a doorway to all these disturbances, and then we can look at who has been responsible for the disturbances themselves. So if, if you like, I'll say a little bit about 9-11. 8.45, September 11, 2001, and Flight 11 out of Boston slammed into one of the towers. And we all know the carnage and the horror that was to follow that. When we begin to look at the event of 9-11, there are quite a lot of surprises. For instance, a team called Able Danger, made up of rather orthodox intelligence, had found the flyers and Mohammed Atta, the supposed leader of it all, in January of 2000. Uh, they were blocked by the FBI, by military intelligence, and told not to investigate. 
Senator Spector asked the Pentagon Chief of Intelligence what had happened to the large amounts of documentation on the ATA team, and he said it was all deleted. He was asked the question again, he just said, yeah, we deleted it all. When one of the actual flowers turned himself in, he was sent home. Somebody called Randy Glass also found out about the towers and wrote to Senator Graham. He was told they knew all about the planes, although planes had not been mentioned by Glass. When Glass wrote in again, he was told to keep quiet. When you say one of the flyers, uh, were you talking about a supposed terrorist? Yes, indeed. The, the team that was supposed to have blown the planes into the towers. And, and he, he was presumably sent back to his native he was country? Indeed. Now, it's pretty certain that these terrorists who were supposed to be flying big jets had no flying skills at all. And yet, when you look at the event of the plane striking the towers, it's obvious that uh, whatever was flying them or whoever was flying them had to be extremely skilled. So we start turning up a few little problems here. At the time, there were airliners being flown by radio control. They just developed that in the early parts of 2001. So the question is whether, in fact, there was a bit more going on. And the GPS signal around the towers was at level 10 and not at 4 as usual. So this is a very strange event, suggesting something very important was being played out. But then we have to add another little complex bit in that aircraft do not bring down steel buildings. And the aircraft are, in a sense, irrelevant to what happened, although they did provide a mask for the real perpetrators. When you've got a steel cage building, which is proofed against fire, it doesn't come down when an aircraft hits it. As well as the Arab team from Saudi Arabia, the, the flyers themselves, there were plenty of, Isra of Israeli activity. It's probable that the young movements, Hamas and for Israel Ergun, was the source of two teams operating in America. But it's not entirely certain that they are to be seen as the, the prime culprits for what happened. Israelis and Arabs from Saudi Arabia might have been part of the, the demolition of these buildings, but of course something else exploded in the Twin Towers, according to those who have looked under the surface. An Israeli phone, in fact, moved out of the Twin Towers a week before the strike, and at least two Israelis we know were warned two hours before the event. So there's an awful lot of knowledge about. A retired Israeli Defence Force officer heard the Twin Towers strike being discussed in a Jewish cemetery in October of 2000 and told the FBI. So there are lots of things going on here, a certain amount of common knowledge and definite scientific doubt about the outcome, which was the fall of those towers. It's also been noticed that at the Trade Centre there was a van and three Israelis were standing on top of it and dancing for absolute joy as the towers collapsed. So there was this sort of feeling that somehow it might be like the Ergun looking forward to rapture and the sort of Armageddon scenario that brings forward the state of Israel. But again, we're only just looking at these things and trying to make sense of what on earth was going on. Pashenik, the Patrick Games character who became Jack Ryan on the film, advisor to five presidents stated 9-11 was to mobilise into war. The military responsible are known to me and I to them. The CIA, Wolfowitz, Cheney, Hadley, Ross, Rice, Air Force Generals, Intel, CIA Ops were involved. It was a false flag, a lie, and the 9-11 Commission that looked at it was just nonsense. Cheney, Rumsfeld, Rice should have been put on trial with Abrahams and Wolfowitz and more. He stated on radio and TV that he wanted a trial at which he would give testimony. Now he's on film, he's on radio, and so you have to put that into the mix of what is going on here. He stated that if FBI agents got close, they were blocked by their bosses. So in other words, insight into what happened with intelligence services at this time, that they were being blocked in certain ways, probably towards the top, if not at the top, but they were doing their job as you would expect them to do. Now, the CIA had an asset called Susan Linda, and she was locked up for a year uh, following these events and was very nearly given a chemical lobotomy to suggest that she was mad. She was basically just under the, the various laws that had been changed there, was just locked up like that and taken out of commission. And her boss, according to her, was bribed with millions to keep quiet. And she stated very clearly that a thermite bomb was used on the buildings and that this was a USA military weapon, not that somebody else, well, somebody else might have one, but it was a very special kind of weapon, highly advanced and does not get into buildings unless it is placed there. Now, she was quite senior in her way. She was chief asset for Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Syria, 
Egypt, Malaysia, and uh, she was told to tell Saddam Hussein months before 9-11 that if he didn't say who was behind the 9-11 plot, he would be bombed back into the Stone Age and hit harder than ever before. As Susan pointed out, he wanted peace and had opened up massive trade deals for America. So we're beginning to see another side of America. We're beginning to see a person who really, I suppose, invented PSYOPs, Mechanic, and you're beginning to see a, a senior CIA asset speaking on, speaking on radio, speaking on film, on video, and saying something that you know, many of us will not have heard. When you just mentioned America, we're not talking about the American people. We're talking about that part of the American structure, the government, etc., that has been taken over by the globalists. That is very true. And we have to keep that in mind all the time, that when you get these peaks of power in America, it goes straight across into places like Frankfurt and Switzerland. So don't let's say that America is responsible for what happened in America. It's much more complex than that. And it's beginning to look very much as though this ghastly event was arranged by people who were only using America for their own purposes. And thank you for clarifying that, because I think that's very important. Now, in the towers, there were hundreds of witnesses to explosions. And you've only got, well, in fact, I've put quite a lot of them in the book, but you've only got to look at that to realise there's something terribly wrong here. This included the police and the fire services, and some of these explosions were very clearly witnessed. There are three firemen, and they're on tape, suggesting that there was an explosion in the lobby. They said it was horrible, and they were asked, was this a secondary explosion? And they said, yes, there was definitely a second explosion. On our way upstairs, the whole thing blew. There were three explosions after the plane hit. Now, police, firemen, civilians, news all said the same thing. And indeed, there are actually recordings of explosions in the buildings. So buildings do not collapse because a plane hits them. And steel does not give way when treated against fire, as in the case of the Trade Centre buildings. In any case, the towers fell into their own footprint in complete freefall. So someone took out the basement network of steel girders. Otherwise, this would not happen. Danish scientist Niels Harrit Copenhagen University, found nanothermite material attached to the twin tower wreckage. This um, material melts metal and blows it apart, so it's both an explosive and it also melts it. He found tiny red chips of unreacted thermite, just as Susan, that's the CIA asset, had said. These bits had not gone off, and the city department staff stated the steel was bursting into flames, welding itself onto other steel, flowing in channels and pooling, and even melting the workers' boots. So nine scientists found thermite as unreacted pyrotechnic explosives. Now, Kevin Rahn uh, lost his job as a lab director for writing a report that said aircraft fuel could not have done it. And when we look at uh, Building 7, this was a planned demolition. The building moved inward at the top and collapsed at high speed into its own footprint. It was in freefall, which meant all its central columns had been taken out. It wouldn't do it otherwise. You might get some odd circumstance whereby a little bit of the building came down, but this went straight down into its footprint. It was timed in seconds and it was a complete freefall. Many people have written about this and have been completely ignored. This might be new information for a lot of people, and they may not realise that Building 7 was actually not hit by a plane at all. Yes, this is correct and they have, may have seen or may not have seen the tape where it is stated that a farmer was saying the building will be coming down, uh, appeared to be giving a countdown, and then said quite audibly on the video, run for your lives. This is recorded, of course. Then there was a huge boom that buckled the windows and shook the ground. So I would agree with, with what you're saying. There was a fire uh, could burn for, for days on end and not actually bring the building down. The damage it received was not particularly bad, but that's not what happened, is it? The, the building had no steel network at its base and just went down into its own footprint. And the seconds of the fall have been um, properly gauged. So there we come up with lots of different ideas, but I think the whole thing is beginning to point to something else. And so, in a sense, you need the book to see what I've said and to see whether the reason uh, is, is correct or not. I can only sort of skate over things um, as I am doing. And then we come to the Pentagon. And, you know, if one bit of 9-11 wasn't quite correct, then possibly all of it isn't quite correct. Flight 77 is supposed to have flown into the Pentagon, but it left no proper debris. There's no engines. They were huge, of course. No engines, seats, 
tailplane missing, bodies, they're missing too. The engines would, in fact, on the flight path it was supposed to be on, would have ripped up the lawn. The wings themselves would have torn into the building, which, if you look at photographs of it, you'll see there are no marks of any wings there at all. So the whole thing is beginning to look extremely shaky. It was very clearly not on the flight path suggested by the black box. In fact, many reliable people, from flyers to police, saw this Flight 77 uh, on a different course altogether, and the plane was seen by a policeman as it flew away from the Pentagon anyway. Now, we know that two objects hit the Pentagon. One was thought to be an unmanned drone, which seems to have struck uh, slightly after a very bright, bright flash, possibly a rocket strike, with the great possibility that explosives also were in the Pentagon and set to destroy various records of trillion-dollar fraud. All the films of this event have disappeared, and now you know how many security cameras you have around these sort of areas. Only one film has been handed back, as far as I know at the moment, and experts have said that, that the frame or frames have been removed, so that the object that actually struck the Pentagon could not be identified. Now, all these things have got to be sort of thought out, and you have to ask the question why people would be wanting to hide this if they themselves have nothing to hide. Yeah, I'd just like to bring in a couple of points. The first, you, you just briefly mentioned about a fraud. It was announced the day before that they had mislaid, lost $23 trillion. And um, surprise, surprise, that all got forgotten the next day with 9-11. And the second thing I'd like to point people towards is Jesse Ventura did a very good episode on the Pentagon on his conspiracy series. And he had an eyewitness on who was actually working in the office that was hit. And she walked out through the hole in the wall that was made by supposedly the plane. And her first thoughts were that a bomb had gone off because she saw no plane debris. So I would suggest that people watch that film. It should be still out there on YouTube. Yes, thank you for that. Those are very good points. Aeroplanes actually do not make neat holes in concrete, and something had gone through 12 layers of concrete, making a neat hole. So obviously things have been concealed. A very well-conducted investigation showed that the plane was supposed to have cut through some lamp posts, which uh, were just, just lying on the ground where they fell. And one of these lampposts was supposed to have gone through a taxi's front window. Now, the question is, were the lampposts planted to show a sort of bogus flight path? The taxi driver, in explaining that a large section of light post went through the front windscreen, was unable to explain why his car bonnet was unmarked, or why he was photographed at the time in an area where he said he was not, and why he kept changing his story. When he thought he was not being recorded, he said this, it's not the truth, it's his story. It has nothing to do with the truth. It's too big for me, ma'am. It's a big thing. You know, this is a world thing happening. I'm a small man. I'm not supposed to be involved in this. This is for other people, people who have money. I'm in it. We came across the highway together. So he is questioned. You must have planned it. It was planned, he said. When people do things and get away with it, it's going to come to me. It's too big. I can't do nothing. It has to be stopped in the beginning. So now we're beginning to see sort of events which, frankly, should have gone to the 9-11 Commission and should have been resolved there. There's an awful lot of evidence which has simply been shoveled to one side to tell a, a very one-sided story. And I would say, just as been, has, has been commented on just now, that Building 7 that came down, a clear demolition, had within it many files and documents on massive frauds. And here in the Pentagon, the bit of the Pentagon that was working on these huge frauds, as we've heard, sums of money that can't really be imagined. They're too big to be imagined. Just, just massive, massive, massive sums of money. Um, the investigation was going on in the department that was blown up. In the book, there is a picture of a pointed object at ground level heading for the Pentagon. It's not a traditional plane because it's too close to the ground and is assumed to be a radio-controlled drone. It's not a very good picture, but you'll see the point of it and wonder what it is. And then there's a smoking trail, which I've also put in there, which is the, the trail of one engine, which you would expect to find on something like a, a radio-controlled drone, which is just an aircraft being, being controlled in where it goes. And in that particular picture that I release, uh, indeed, someone has taken out a certain amount of information before it was released. Looking at it, there does appear to be a flash from the Pentagon before this drone gets there, suggesting a rocket strike and explosions within the Pentagon, or indeed both. 
Two rocket and radiation experts confirmed a rocket strike in their opinion and the use at the Pentagon of de depleted uranium. As with Building 7, which housed records of massive frauds lost in the fall of that building, so the part of the Pentagon hit held records, computers and people looking at trillion dollar fraud. Even at high speed crashes, passenger liners leave their tail, engines, seats, bodies, fuselage sections. But when you look at the photographs, well, there aren't any. Just small debris and a possible small engine. Now, Rumsfeld, uh, when he was making a speech at the Pentagon, did make a slight mistake when he said a rocket hit the Pentagon, but there have been no words since. The Truth Society, made up of many experts, has been ignored by the press and media and officials, which says a great deal about the loss of freedom of speech in democracy today. There is professional disagreement about the destruction of three buildings and damage to a fourth. People do not blame American leadership, but they do feel they're being taken for a ride and that the old untouchables are in their country. Mishenik, intelligence and presidential advisor, has named who he thinks is responsible for the, the problems from within the American administration, which is not the same thing as saying America. Firemen and police have described an inside job and destruction that clearly has little to do with aeroplanes or lesser bombs, although they may have been used. Yeah, if, if a missile or a drone went into the Pentagon, then what, what happened to the original plane? I know we've got a guess at this, but that, that plane had numerous passengers on, so presumably they had to eliminate them somehow or some way. Well, I haven't, um, in what I'm saying, haven't sort of entered into speculation about anything very much. It seems to me that what we're dealing with is obvious facts that need to be discussed and sorted out. There was an operation northward in America made up of senior chiefs who wanted to have an invasion of Cuba and an excuse to do it. And what they did do there was fly a passenger liner uh, towards Cuba, uh, then substituted for it with a, with a drone. And the aircraft itself was then flown back to a, a base, an intelligence base. Operation Northwood was put forward by the military and it was turned down by President Kennedy. So it never actually took place, but it was on paper. Now, I, I can't obviously speculate what happened after the aircraft was seen flying away, but that's, you have to leave a few little things hanging in the air. And that, uh, in my view, needs to be investigated along with a, a whole lot of other very unfortunate events. The Japanese parliament uh, discussed all this and they said, you know, aircraft don't do these sort of things to buildings and concluded this is all very weird. So there are a lot of questions in the air and really it's time for the matter to be reconsidered again, I think. This is what Rockefeller said. He stated that some believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure, one world if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. Now, it's in that area, not necessarily this person, but it's in that area that I think we should be beginning to look for some answers to all this. Right, well, let's start tying some of these threads together. You've talked about the problems in the Middle East. You've talked about 911. So how does this all tie in with the bankers? It does tie in with the bankers. And I will mention before that the secret lodges, because I want to take this back away from the America of Pashenik. And I've no doubt that he had reason to say what he said. And we'd like to hear more from him. But I want to talk about Mazzini and Pike going back into the 1800s. I have looked at a prophecy which Pike wrote, which mentions the two towers, and I have decoded that in the book, so I'm not going to try and explain that. But it would appear that Albert Pike, who's a, a grandmaster in America in the 1800s, and Mazzini, who is this world terrorist, uh, they were working together, and Pike produced this prophecy of the fall of the two towers. Like I said to you, all that we are seeing, I believe, was planned in blueprint and outline in the 1700s. So I'm taking a rather different line anyway from what you would perhaps expect. And then Mazzini and Pike had letters together about the three world wars, World War One, World War Two, and World War Three, which they spelt out in considerable detail. 
So that is also sort of thrown into the pot because the bankers and the lodges actually always work together. And it would appear that Red Masonry was aware of 9-11 events and was also prepared to sort of write about it in a very concealed kind of way. So that's in the book as part of trying to unwrap what occurred, that 9-11 was actually a logical step in a process that led up from War 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then a 7, with this being the sort of early days of, of the bankers trying to cause another global war. Now, looking at these mega bankers, uh, immersed as they have been in war making in the past, and that's all, it's not controversial, it's all written down anyway, seem to have latched onto this seven war idea from the War of Independence, Red Lodges working in the War of Independence, French Revolution with the same Red Lodges working away, American Civil War, same pattern with Rothschild and Astor becoming visible in the American Civil War, Mazzini over there making sure the war took place alongside the president, Russian Revolution, same Red Lodges, and involved in that because it didn't work very well, Rothschild, Rockefeller, Jacob Schiff, J.P. Morgan, Warburg's American International Company, AIC, Fabian Society Roundtable Lodges. So we're beginning to sort of build up a picture, and later on you'll be able to read, if you want to, about World War II and how that was planned, because it's quite relevant. Uh, we know a lot about that, and it's very similar to what's going on in the Middle East today. And then you've got the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, again, the same as in the 1700s and 1800s, being wound up uh, clearly by mega bankers and the Red Lodges, which were set up at the same time in 1710. So you've got this sort of swill and background, uh, and I've mentioned those people who were attached to the Russian Revolution. So now we come to this long, ghastly sort of debacle in the Middle East. First, there's the same banker, Rothschild, and we're not talking about a specific person, as I mentioned in the book. We're talking about these copper lines that conduct the electricity of war. A manager for the Rothschilds, a major manager of the Rothschilds, is called Hartman. And he ran the BCCI Bank of London as elsewhere, which paid for terrorism and also spread nuclear knowledge in the Middle East. Not controversial. It's in the American reports. Then comes Rockefeller, again, second one from the Russian Revolution, whose Brzezinski created world terrorism and set it off at Afghanistan with calamitous results because we've now got these armed people all over the place. Then there's J.P. Morgan, uh, again, Russian Revolution, who was heading the round table in America, uh, along with, well, of course, the other bankers like Rockefeller. And it's these groups, this extension of the round table, Council of Foreign Relations, Bilderberg and Trilaterate, that formed the Planning the New American Century, which was a very aggressive plan for world domination and first strike advocates of war. Uh, then there's the warburg Pinctus element. Uh, Warburg funded the Russian Revolution uh, that hired Rockefeller's friend Kissinger, who came up with this extraordinary arc of evil clash of civilizations. And then there's Jacob Schiff, Russian Revolution, who created the Schofield Bible, which is actually currently being used to wind up ideas of Armageddon. We haven't accounted for the dodgy Quran, uh, although we know when that was started by East India agent Mr. Hemphur in 1710, but we can't tell exactly who is behind the printing of that. Today, now this is not controversial, the scholars of Islam, who are great people, will tell you uh, the Quran has been changed and not for the better. Uh, and that's just local volumes of the Quran, it doesn't mean the whole thing. So unrest in the Middle East and a series of wars has been partnered by this, um, we'll call it splinter CIA trilateral unit, and has involved those named as funders both of the European Union, Russian Revolution and the Hitler era. As I said, we're tracing the electricity, not the wires. And this electricity goes to the round table in Britain and then off to Europe, where it's all interconnected through the British American project. Pashenik has blamed those named in America for 9-11 as that attack not being genuinely from abroad. And he has called for a court to override the 9-11 inquiry and to look at the facts again. And Kissinger was, as I said earlier, explained he was part of the rogue empire, not involved with Bush. And he said only America and Britain would understand what he was saying. I just want to say something about Kissinger. There are, there are many people who are quite young who, who are probably listening to this and don't realise his history. And he went to America as a young boy, but he managed to worm his way into the administration as, I presume, a stooge of the bankers because he seems to have a finger in every pie. But I'd just like to say one quote of Henry Kissinger, which I think 
people who sort of think they're being patriotic by supporting the military need to register. And he's, he's said to have said it to Haig. And it is, military men are just dumb, stupid animals to be used as pawns in foreign policy. And I think that just sums it up, the way they treat the, uh, the military. Well, that's an interesting quote. And one would say that if you create terrorists and arm terrorists, then it may be that your army is going to have to face that particular problem. So we don't have a problem with armies and navies and the Air Force. What we're trying to do is look beneath the surface and see these things being deliberately formed so that people have to react to them. And I thought I might just slip in here a comment by Nick Rockefeller to filmmaker Aaron Russo about the plan to microchip the population. And Rockefeller warned him about an event that would allow us to invade Afghanistan and Iraq. And this was some 11 months before 9-11 and also foretold the fact that the war on terror would be a hoax, wherein soldiers would be looking in caves for non-existent enemies. Rockefeller also, of course, tried to recruit Aaron Rousseau into the Council of Foreign Relations. So there we are, there's lots to think about, and I, I always think there's an awful lot to investigate, and I'm sort of wondering why this isn't going on right now. Now, I want to just sort of draw this to a little bit of a conclusion because I'm not going to look to this particular event I'm going to, to describe as how things will happen, or rather how it's hoped they will happen, because um, it may not be like this. But I'd like to, I have talked a lot about Armageddon, the Middle East being wound up for some significant purpose, which seems to be beyond taking over country after country. We seem to be moving towards some sort of conclusion. So let me just sort of say this at the end, which is a, a warning, really, for people to uh, be on the alert, to sow peace, to be very careful about who is an authority, to start examining banks and where the money's going, and particularly to look at who is funding this continued process of terrorism, if other than the Trilateral Commission. Israeli police turned back members on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, uh, called Land of Israel Faithful Movement, as they attempted to em enter the Dome of the Rock there in Jerusalem and to anoint the cornerstone of a third temple in Jerusalem. Now, this area, of course, is sacred to Islam, too. So the Schofield Bible, which wants Armageddon, actually does mention the third temple nonsense. Had the Israeli authorities allowed these Temple Mount fanatics to carry out their provocation, the Dome of the Rock and the Alaska Mosque, being amongst the holiest sites in Islam, and target to scores of terrorist attacks by right-wing Jewish Temple Mount terrorists, a holy war of incalculable consequence would have erupted. Executive Intelligence Review explained that a certain Lord N is by his own admission a practitioner of the satanic rituals of Aleister Crowley, and here we see yet another connection between subversive groups, Satanism, and what is going on. Crowley, of course, was part of the English set of John Yarker, which sowed lodges all over Europe, uh, eventually to start World War II. So in 1995, the Jerusalem Freemasonic Lodge was formed close to the Temple Mount, again, intending to rebuild Solomon's Temple. And of course, this is just the act of war. In Michael Leiden's book, War Against Terror Masters, he states, the awesome power of a free society committed to a single mission is something our enemies cannot imagine. Our unexpectedly quick and impressive victory in Afghanistan is a prelude to a much broader war, which will in all likelihood transform the Middle East for at least a generation and reshape the politics of many older countries around the world. So we have to look at Leiden and his connections. He was often quoted daily by people like Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz. Then, as now, Leiden was calling for regime change beyond Iraq, and stated the time for diplomacy is at an end. It is time for a free Iran, a free Syria, a free Lebanon. He is also the same person uh, who called for the United States to wage war against Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Sudan, Libya, because he alleges they are masters of terror. Now, you know, you've got to connect in these things and the build-up of nasty lodges around the dome and the involvement of people like Leiden. I've put what that involvement is in, in the book, incidentally. And then we come to February the 24th, 2012, which is um, not very long ago. Violent riots broke out at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem after Friday morning prayers. Crowds of Muslim worshippers threw stones at Israeli police and border guards and eventually entered the Alaska Mosque compound. 
Israel's news reported the riots broke out at the Temple Mount and rioting was so extreme that a rare decision was made to send Israeli security forces in to the Alaska Mosque compound to use stun grenades to break up the hundreds of Muslim worshippers there. The riots were in reaction to the news that a large group of Jewish right-wing activists intended to enter the mosque to destroy the Alaska Mosque and the Dome of the Rock as part of the plan to build the Third Temple. The Alaska Mosque affair is actually called the Armageddon Project, which is very interesting uh, in terms of what we've been talking about. And the hawks behind it come from the same source, that is the round table, from which come the bankers we have been discussing. And it just so happens a presidential advisor has named the hawks he holds responsible for 9-11, which ties together 9-11 and the present attempts at World War III. What can be said here is that people who have been involved in the Contra affair and various rather sinister things uh, have also been involved in planning the destruction of the dome in Jerusalem and the building of a third temple. And I've put that information in the book. And I did certainly conclude that one or two people, 1% of our population, probably less, are taking the most enormous risks in the Middle East. Their polities are quite bizarre. And it is time really for Western people not only to signal that Middle Eastern people are just our fellow human beings and comrades, but to realise that there's a political religion around which is not doing anybody any good, that there is the traditional war-making banker involved in all this, and it's time for a lot of thought, a certain amount of action, a certain awareness about how Britain has become involved and on, on which side. Uh, and I should say it's also a time for a certain amount of prayer. So what it all boils down to is that we're all busy watching all these little events, no, not so little events going on in the world, wars, crises, terrorist acts. But it, it's a bit like a magician. You're, you're busy watching his trick, but you're not seeing what he's doing behind the scenes. And I think it all boils down to going back and seeing what is going on behind the scenes and taking it straight back to these bankers, to these corrupt individuals who are pulling all the strings and manipulating world events. I think that's very true and very good. We've got to get to the point where the untouchables are touched. We've got to get to the base of all this unbridled greed and power. And we've got to get to the base of the subversion of news, media in general, and I have to say, to the subversion of democracy itself.